Welcome to the last session of the Mount of Evolution. As you know, this year we are holding the 6th of annual Evolution Days online as Month of Evolution, which started on 12th of February, which is Diving Day, and will finish on today. This is our final talk with Jane Goodall. As both University Science Club, our goal is to facilitate access to science and accurate information to support scientific thinking, hereby to contribute to the scientific enlightenment, which is our common dream, as we can. You all know this year's event is organized in difficult conditions, and we try to do our best as both University Science Club students. At this point, we feel the need to inform you. We are standing with our friends who got arrested during the protests against the non-democratic rector appointment that happened on 2nd of January. We are standing with Free Academia. We don't accept, we don't give up, and we won't bow down. In any case, we will bring science to you. And now, let's tell you about the program. We will start, a vi start with a video of Dr. Goodall, and later, Dr. Goodall will have a 20 minute talk. After Dr. Goodall's talk, we will have another short video, and then we will have a 20 minutes question and answer session. Finally, we will finish the month of evolution. Uh, and now I want to give the floor to our dear mentor, Asan Niksarlı. Uh, she made it possible to host Dr. Jane Goodall in this event. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Goodall, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. This is a very special and very inspiring day for us. So we are very happy to have you in Turkey again. So I would love to give you some brief information about Dr. Goodall, which is very, very hard because she has done so many things and uh, I guess it will be better to watch our video, but we know Dr. Goodall with her works with chimpanzees and her activism among um, animal uh, conservation in Jane Goodall Institute and her work with Roots and Shoots. Now let's start with a video of her to understand her a little better. And then we'll have Dr. Goodall uh, share her uh, work in uh, Gombe National Park, and then we'll continue. What I saw so quickly, it seemed, the environment outside the National Park had been utterly destroyed. The trees had gone. The land was over-farmed and infertile. They were struggling to survive. And that's when I realized that unless we helped the people to improve their lives, there was no way we could even try to save the precious chimpanzees. This was when we started Take Care or Takari, our community-centered conservation project. Everywhere I So now we're listening to your uh, very exciting journey in Gombe, Dr. Goodall. Well, first of all, uh, hello, everybody. And I'm going to start off with what seems very appropriate. You're quite far away from me in Turkey. I'm in the UK. And uh, the chimpanzees have a call which they use to identify themselves when they're separated by a valley, for example. So <clears throat> I'm going to start off greeting you in chimpanzee. <laughs> that seems appropriate. So <laughs> and that simply means this is me, this is Jane. Well, <clears throat> you all know that I did manage to follow my childhood dream. I dreamt when I was 10 that I would go to Africa and live with wild animals and write books about them. It wasn't easy in those days, and I'm 67 now, so this is a long time ago. And in those days, women weren't scientists. We didn't have any money. World War II was raging. And when I told everybody what I was going to do, they laughed at me and said, Jane, dream about something you can achieve, but not my mother. And this is an important message that I take everywhere around the world. But she said to me, if you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And then if you don't give up, maybe you find a way. And so that that was the message that she gave to me and kept up my hope. And I had to work as a waitress to get the money to pay my fare when I was invited to Africa by a school friend 
whose parents had bought a farm. That's how I got there. That's when I met the famous Dr. Louis Leakey, paleontologist, spending his life searching for early human remains. And he'd been looking, he says, for years for somebody to go and study our closest relatives in the wild. Nobody had done it, nobody. So of course I said yes. And eventually we got money in after six months and I set off into this unknown world. And the big problem at first was they ran away. The chimpanzees had never seen a white ape before and we are apes, we are the fifth great ape. And and they just disappeared into the forest. But fortunately, one of them, David Greybeard, I named him because of his beautiful white beard. You can see him behind me up here. He's very special, so I'll bring him a little closer so you can see him, see his white chin beard. Anyway, he began to lose his fear before the others. And it was David Greybeard on that very special, amazing day four months into my study, when I saw him sitting on a termite mound, breaking off grass stems, using them to fish for, for termites, pushing it down into the nest and picking them off. And then I saw him pick a leafy twig. He had to strip off the leaves and to make that into a tool. So it was exciting then because scientists thought humans and only humans used and made tools. That was the observation that enabled Leakey to go to National Geographic Society. They agreed to give me money when my six months grant ran out and they sent a photographer, filmmaker, Hugo van Lauwick, who became my husband. But the main thing was that he was able to document on film all of these amazing things chimps were doing. And before that, well, so many people, especially in the scientific world, why should we believe her? She hasn't been to college, because we couldn't afford it. She hasn't been to college. Uh, she's only just arrived in Africa. So why should we believe it when she says chimpanzees use tools and chimpanzees behave in many ways like we do? But when Hugo filmed it, they had to believe. At any rate, looking back now over 60 years of research, let me tell you in a very brief form something about how chimpanzee society at Gombe is organized. It took a long time to actually understand all of this, but I'm giving you the benefit of looking back over the years. So Gombe National Park is very small. It's just about 35 square kilometers. But when I got there, it was part of the great equatorial forest belt that stretched right across Africa. And so although there were 150 chimpanzees approximately within the park, the communities to the north and the south moved out. So they had a lot more space then. They weren't confined within the tiny national park. And as you saw in that little video, today all the forest around Gombe has gone. But back then, as I say, about 150 individuals, and they were divided into three, what I called communities. And in a community, there'd be four to 10 fully adult males, rather more adult females, and then adolescents and juveniles and infants. And each of these communities has a territory and the males patrol the boundaries of these territories and they keep out the males from other communities. They're protecting the resources, of their own females and young. They do try to lure in young unattached females from the other communities that increases the genetic mix, prevents inbreeding, but the males may be chased and attacked. And the older females too, which was a shock. So the older females can be attacked and killed, the males can be attacked and killed, but the young females, they 
want to bring them in to add to their own female uh, population. Took a long time to find that all out. And when I found that they had these brutal territorial battles, I was a bit shocked. In fact, I was horrified. I thought they were like us, but nicer. So let's go on to the other things where they're so like us. First of all, the males have a dominance hierarchy. And when two males are competing for dominance, it reminds me a little bit of some human male politicians. Anyway, the chimpanzee has a charging display. You saw one example of that in the video. And the more vigorous and frequent these charging displays, when they chase across the ground, dragging branches, throwing rocks, the more dramatic, the higher they're likely to rise in the hierarchy. They don't want to fight each other because they can get hurt. So they try to do bluff, intimidate each other. And different males have different strategies. And I could tell you so many stories, but we don't have time. Some males make use of just their big physical size and aggression. And they attack the higher ranking individuals till they get to the top. <clears throat> Other males, they are more strategic. They form alliances and they only threaten a higher ranking male when their ally is there and the two of them charge towards the higher ranking one together. And then we have males who are just so determined that even though they may get attacked by their superiors, they just recover from their wounds and they come back and they disrupt every grooming session. Chimpanzees spend a lot of time, like all the primates, social primates, grooming each other. And goblin will just interrupt all of these sessions again and again and again. And he had strategic charging displays. He would go higher up the mountainside and then charge down and he'd be very quiet. So it was a surprise. Of course, the others rushed out of the way. So goblin got to the top at a very young age just by sheer persistence. So it's pretty clear, isn't it? The chimpanzees have very different personalities. And now we come to the females. That was my favorite part of the study, watching the development of the relationship between a mother chimpanzee and her infant as it grew up. And there are different kinds of mothers. The example of a wonderful mother was old Flo. She was already about 40 when I first got there. She had quite a large family. And the main characteristic of Flo was that she supported all her offspring. Whatever happened, if they were in trouble, she would charge in with her few hairs bristling and she had very few teeth left. They were worn to the gum and she was fearless in defense of her young. So even a big male baboon, we have baboons at Gombe with their long canine teeth, they would rush out of her way. And her offspring and the other offspring of supportive mothers tend to do much better. The males are more self-assured, they get to a higher position in the hierarchy, and the females are better mothers. So we have females who are much less good who are not so supportive, their offspring don't do so well. We had one mother who was totally inefficient and her first two infants died because she didn't know how to care for them. So we therefore learned a lot of maternal behavior is learned by the young female watching her own mother with an infant. And then as the infant is a bit older, the older child is allowed to carry the infant around. So we think that this female Patty, who was so hopeless, maybe she was the last born and had no experience of how to treat a baby. So for example, most mothers will put their hand under the back of a, of a newborn baby that can't yet cling very well. And Patty sort of got the idea that she should support the baby but she'd support the rump so that the head would go bump, bump, bump along the ground. 
not surprising. And she didn't know how to position the baby so that the baby could suckle. So gradually, as she had her third child, that child survived. And by the time she had her fourth child, she was quite a good mother. So she learned. Chimpanzees communicate with postures and gestures very like our own. They kiss, they embrace, they hold hands, they pat one another. As I've said, they swagger, they threaten, they use rocks as missiles, they throw them at each other. And they do these postures and gestures in the same context we do, like two greeting chimps will embrace one another. And clearly these communication signals mean the same thing. It was very obvious as the weeks and months and years went by that chimpanzees have emotions, happiness, sadness, fear, despair, anger, grief, very much like ours. And it was very clear too, there were differences in intelligence between different individuals. And one individual, Mike, was highly intelligent. And for example, he was quite a small male. He wasn't a very aggressive male, but he had a real ambition to become top ranking or alpha male. He didn't fight, he did displays, but he, at that time, the chimps were coming to my camp and there were a lot of empty tin uh, cans that came with, with oil for lighting the lamps, kerosene. And Mike learned that he could take one, two, or even three of these cans that were about so big, and he would charge towards higher ranking males, hitting and kicking these cans ahead of him, it made a terrible noise. The other males rushed out of his way, and he got to the top in four months. As far as we know, there was no bad fight. So, Mike showed intelligence in many other ways. Figan was another one, highly intelligent. Whereas individuals like Joe Neo and Sherry, they, they made so many mistakes and they kept, kept doing silly things. Food, chimpanzees do hunt small mammals. Not that often, but they do. And they really love hunting. And they hunt as a group or by themselves. The females tend to find a baby bush buck in the, lying on the ground and grab it. So they hunt by themselves. The males will get together and surround, for example, a colobus monkey troop. And one will creep up towards an intended victim. Some of them wait on the ground, others out on the nearby trees. And then the, the hunter will pounce on the monkey and if it gets away there'll be others ready to try and catch it and if it falls which it sometimes does then the ones waiting on the ground will grab it and after the excitement of a kill has died down the chimpanzee who has control of the body the carcass will very often share the others gather around and they beg with palm outstretched like this I, for the most part, chimpanzees eat fruit and leaves and flowers and sometimes bark, as well as insects like termites and ants and caterpillars, but sometimes they hunt. What's really fascinating is that we now know that chimpanzees in different parts of Africa have different cultures. If we define culture, as a behavior that has passed from one generation to the next through observation and learning. So when our chimps at Gombe fish for termites, you see the infants watching intently. And when they're very small, they try to imitate some of what they've seen. And one infant, Flint, he loved the idea of poking a little twig into the hole but he didn't get the idea of where to poke it. So he was always poking it in his mother's hair, sometimes in her ear, it was really quite comical. And then gradually they get the idea a little bit better. 
But instead of getting a tool that's just right about this long, ready to push down, uh, they may get a little tiny tool, which isn't any use at all, or they may get a very long bendy one, and that doesn't work either. But by the time they're about five years old, they're quite good at termite fishing. Well, on, in West Africa, the chimpanzees use rocks to hammer open the hard shells of some kinds of fruit. And that's a much harder task for the infants to learn. They learn it too. And a sort of really good example of how chimpanzees do have these different cultures that are passed on. Because other animals do too. We know that now, like whales. But anyway, chimpanzees. Uh, in most of the places where chimps are studied, the oil nut palm is growing. Chimps love the red fruit of the oil nut palm. And at Gombe, the chimps eat the flesh. And of the tree, they also uh, eat the, I don't know what to call it, they eat the, um, the dead, dead flower, they chew it, they don't swallow it. It must have some kind of mineral in it. If you go over to West Africa, you find the chimpanzees eat the flesh, but they also use rocks to hammer open the nut inside. If you go to a place quite near Gombe, also in Tanzania, with plenty of palm trees, the chimpanzees don't eat any of it. Not the bark, not the fruit, not the stone. So these kind of cultures are passed from one community to another. Very fascinating is how chimpanzees can adapt and that, of course, is a, a very important strategy in evolution. And to give an example, at Gombe, the chimpanzees climb into a tree every night. They bend over the branches. They make a nice, comfy sleeping platform or nest. Sometimes they'll pick a little handful of leafy twigs and make a pillow. They like to be comfortable. And unlike gorillas, they never foul their nests. They pee over the edge, etc. Anyhow, they stay in that nest until morning. If you go over to where chimpanzees are being studied by our institute in Senegal and Mali, that's the absolute extreme of the chimpanzee range. The forests are just gallery forests and it's very, very hot. It's extremely hot, I've been there. Well, chimpanzees there, when there's a moon, they will leave their nest at night because it's so much cooler and they'll forage at night. And they even go and spend time in caves. Well, we don't have caves at Gombe, so we don't know about that. In Uganda, which has the same kind of forest as Gombe, uh, their habitat has been extremely destroyed by growing human populations cutting down more and more forest as they graze their cattle or get new land for agriculture. And so, because the chimpanzees' own food is less, as they have less habitat, they've begun raiding crops. Well, that's dangerous. It's dangerous for the chimps, dangerous for people too. And we've had infants killed. But because it's dangerous for the chimps, they too, have begun leaving their nests on moonlit nights and raiding the crops in the moonlight. So I think this gives you an idea of chimpanzee behavior in the wild. And there isn't time to go into it, but a lot of work has been done on intelligence in captivity. And there are some wonderful, wonderful studies of chimpanzee intellect. In, in America, deaf people communicate with American Sign Language, all these different signs meaning different things. Chimpanzees can learn more than 600 of those signs. And in Japan, there's a very famous chimpanzee called Ai with her son Ayumu, and they do incredible projects on the computer. You can look it all up. And Something that I find really fascinating, these chimps who've learned a language, 
they you you could learn something about the way their mind works. So just one story here. And that's the story of a young captive chimpanzee born in captivity. She was four years old. She was one of the ones who loved to make drawings. Of circles or these kind of marks. And she liked to fill the page with color. Well, on this one occasion, her teacher, because she had kind of lessons every day, handed her her piece of paper. And she went like this on it and handed it back. So the teacher looked at it, just this squiggle like this, and she handed it back and she signed, please finish. So this little chimp looked at the piece of paper and pushed it back and signed, finished. So then the teacher said, what is it? And the chimp signed ball, and I mean a tennis ball. She used to play with tennis balls. So what has the chimpanzee drawn? She's drawn the bouncing of the ball. I don't think we'd ever think of that. We draw a ball, but she drew the bounce. And as I say, sometimes you get little insights through these anecdotes. And I find anecdotes collected up tell you an awful lot about behaviors very seldom observed. But they give insights into what a chimpanzee is capable of and how the mind works. And it's very strange that when I finally went to get a PhD at Cambridge University, I was nervous, I'd never been to college. I'd been two years with the chimps. The professors told me I'd done everything wrong. You shouldn't have named the chimpanzees. You should have numbered them. You shouldn't talk about their minds, capable of problem solving or their personalities, or their emotions. Why? Because those are unique to us. But I've already been taught by my dog, Rusty, as a child, that in this respect, those professors were absolutely wrong. And so I went on talking about chimpanzee personality, their very obvious intelligence, and their emotions, happiness, sadness, fear. And thanks to Hugo's film, lots of other people out in the field. Gradually, scientific attitude has changed. And now, today, if you care, you can actually study in university, chimpanzee mind, chimpanzee intelligence, that is, study chimpanzee personality, some people have, and you can study emotions. So over 60 years, there has been this change, other field studies, other studies in captivity. And in addition, there's all the work done on the genetics so that we know chimpanzees not only behave like us, but we share 98.6 of the structure of our DNA with them. So that's my little summary of chimpanzee behavior as I've seen it in my own life. So thank you very much. Dr. Goodall, thank you. Uh, this this was very inspiring and amazing. Uh, um, I don't know what to say. I usually have tears in my eyes whenever I see you talk or whenever I watch your videos. So now we'll have a, a short video of you again, and then we'll continue with question and answer session. Do you want me to just say about this video that, uh, in, Af that in Africa there are many uh, orphan chimpanzees whose mothers have been shot for bushmeat and they used to be selling them as pets but it's illegal because chimps are endangered but if you confiscate an infant chimp in a market whose mother has been killed you can't put them back in the forest so we started sanctuaries to look after these orphans and this particular video shows a chimpanzee called Wunda and in the local language that means close to death and she came in as a tiny baby, almost dead from the wounds from the gun that shot her mother. And our wonderful veterinarian who runs the sanctuary, Rebecca Atencia, saved her. And then later, when Wunda was about eight years old, she got so sick and again she nearly died. And so this video shows Wunda, one of the ones chosen to go onto a beautiful forested island. And what happened? 
in that video was one of the most amazing things that ever has happened to me in my life. So now let's look at that video. This is a really exciting moment for me. The Jane Goodall Institute Chimpunga Chimpanzee Rehabilitation Center in the Republic of Congo has for years been caring for infants whose mothers were killed, mostly for the illegal bushmeat trade. Many of them are now fully grown. Recently, we acquired three large forested islands on the beautiful Quilu River, where we can release many of the chimpanzees from our overcrowded center. In here is Wunda, and, uh, and all the other chimpanzees we're working to bring here. Chinzula Island will provide a wonderful forest home, where they will be cared for and safe. This video is truly amazing. I bet I'm not the only one who is crying right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really good. Yeah. And this is one of the first videos that we translated for Turkish too about eight, nine, ten years ago, maybe. Yeah. So it's beautiful. <laughs> so, Dr. Goodall, once we announced that you will be speaking in this event, we also asked from different social media accounts like uh, Roots and Shoots Turkey, Signs of uh, Evolution three uh, social media accounts. And we said, if you can ask Dr. Goodall one question, what would that be? And we got tons of answers. So we organized some of them. And now we will start with Charter. And we will start asking, we don't want to take much of your time. So we're going to try to take it, uh, make it short. But we will start with Charter and ask you a couple of questions. Hello again, Dr. Goodall. Uh, it's so good to have you here. I'm a great admirer of yours. And I loved your master class, by the way. It was very inspirational, too. I loved it. And um, what I want to ask you is, as the um, founder of uh, Tree of Evolution, the science group uh, that's hosting, one of the groups that's hosting this event, um, uh, we educate people on evolution, evolutionary biology, why it's important, how it expands our uh, vision, and many other uh, areas of it. I want to ask how evolution, ev evolutionary thinking, evolutionary understanding have shaped uh, your studies, given that uh, chimpanzees are almost identical to us, 98.77% similarity nucleotide-wise. So um, how, how, how did it help you justify your claims about how similar we are in terms of behavior to and what we can learn from them? Well, I'm not sure that I used it to justify my claims because what I used to justify my claims were my own very careful observations and those of the students and the documentary film evidence. But one thing where the, the um, evolutionary picture is very, very important. Once we understand how like us chimpanzees are, not only behavior, but biology, there's mm -hmm. this genetic similarity and also similarities in immune structure, function and blood composition and the anatomy of the brain. Mm -hmm. Because they're so like us, then you look at people and chimpanzees and other apes and clearly there's a pretty major difference. Yes, chimps are very intelligent, but there's no chimpanzee that could design a rocket that goes up to Mars with a little robot that falls around taking photos. There's no chimpanzee that could design this kind of uh, technology that enables me to talk to you in Turkey. So what's the difference? The main difference seems to me to be this explosive development of our <laughs> 
And I believe that that was at least in part triggered by the fact that at some point in our evolution, we developed this way of communicating with words. Yeah. So for the first time, I mean, young chimps learn by watching, but a chimpanzee mother cannot teach her child about something unless it's right there. Mm. And we can bring people together from different walks of life with different skills to try to solve a problem, don't we? We can make plans for the distant future. We can, well, we should be able to learn from, from the past. We're not very good at learning from our mistakes, are we? We repeat <laughs> again and again. And in fact, the, it always leads me to think, look, here we are, the most intellectual creature that's ever walked on this planet, without doubt. So how come we're destroying our only home? We don't want to go and live on Mars. At one time it was thought maybe Mars could support life, but we know it can't. We've only got this one precious planet and we're destroying it. So there seems to be a disconnect yeah. between clever brain and love and compassion that yeah. we poetically place in the heart. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, yes. Thank you, Dr. Goodall. I have another question. So, as you mentioned in your speak as well, that signs and gestures and vocalizations are the communication tools for chimpanzees. And of course, you have been like, you spent years observing them. And we were wondering, uh, what kind of uh, gestures uh, struck you the most? And are there any gestures, uh, vocalizations or signs that you still don't know what that means? And, uh, and finally, will we, or maybe should we ever understand uh, chimpanzees like we understand humans? Uh, I assume we don't really understand humans as well sometimes, but yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I was going to say, we don't understand our behavior, do we? I mean, <laughs> we really don't understand some of our behavior. It's absolutely not possible to understand it, not in any sensible way. But um, the, the, I think, you know, in different chimpanzee studies where the chimps behave differently, we sometimes wonder why do they do this here and not there? Mm -hmm. We don't really know. I always wonder, in, in Gombe, when a young female reaches adolescence, she gets a kind of wanderlust, like a lot of male primates in adolescence. But in, in chimps, it's the females. And they wander off and they're the only individual who can move into a neighboring community without being attacked. And as I said, the males of that community welcome new blood, so to speak. But why at Gombe do some of the young females go out every time they're sexually receptive, then they come back, the next time they go out again. And then finally, some of them will then stay in that other community for the rest of their lives. Others will get pregnant, come back home, so to speak, and stay with mum. And we still don't really know. I mean, some of the students have uh, postulated different reasons, but to me, I'm not satisfied. I don't know why some go and some stay. So, and there are, there are other things like that. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome again, Dr. Goodall. Uh, I want to thank you as a cancer and molecular biology major and say that as a woman trying to be a scientist, talking to you, a leading woman in science, is uh, inspiring and your story is always encouraging for us. And uh, my question is about the relationship between us and chimpanzees. Uh, chimpanzees are known as wild animals, just like humans. How should one look at the relationship between humans and primates in the light of human cultural conditioning, such as monstrous behavior, racism, and atrocity? Oh dear, I didn't quite get all that. I think you're wearing a mask or something. I, or uh, very uh, you know, the, Can you uh, for me, please tell me. Uh, the, the question is, uh, when we look at uh, uh, primates uh, in general, like chimpanzees and humans, how can we uh, learn from them about uh, some crazy human behavior, such as monstrous behavior, uh, racism, and atrocity? Like, do you see those in chimpanzees, and what does it teach uh, us about humans? 
Okay, well, chimpanzees um, are very fearful if one of their members uh, uh, appears who's different. We had a terrible polio uh, epidemic at Gombe, and one chimpanzee came back with paralyzed legs. The others absolutely ostracized because they were frightened. Um, they ostracized and kept away. Mm -hmm. And another one came who'd lost the use of his arms, so he was shuffling along, kind of squatting. And again, the chimps were, were frightened. And as they looked at him, they were all making these big faces of fear. And this poor chimp, of course, he didn't understand they were frightened of him. And he's looking over his shoulder to see what they're frightened of. It was, really <laughs> it was you know, we had, wow. to, we had to kill him. I mean, he, he was already a skeleton and we couldn't leave him like that. The one who lost the use of his legs, Mr. McGregor, he also got the dislocated arm. And that was, those were the worst times of my life. I think, you know, we can learn the chimpanzees are very, very good at resolving things after conflict. And the, the victim of an attack is the subordinate up to the aggressor and actually beg for a reassuring pat on the head or pat on the hand. And once that's happened, then you get the previous good relationships coming back. But interestingly, in Gombe, a female or a male has been attacked, they can just go away. And in captivity, when you have a chimp group in captivity, in a really nice enclosure, even there, the chimpanzee victim cannot escape. And so they're much, much better at resolving conflict in captivity than they are in the wild. And that I find very, very fascinating. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you very much uh, for coming, Dr. Goodall. I sincerely want to say that, especially as a physics and genetics student who is trying to improve himself in Middle East, your presence in here is very valuable for me. Now, um, I want to ask a question from the audience. Uh, Kenan Bektash is ask, asking that. What is your current take on zoos in general? What do you think the future of zoos should be? Well, there are zoos and zoos, and the <laughs> zoos which have money, and they have large and suitable enclosures. They have caring um, keepers. They have employed really well-qualified veterinarians, and they provide education. I know many people who started their career in the field or, or in veterinary, wild animal veterinary medicine because of this at the zoos. The good zoos uh, put a lot of money into conservation programs out in the field, and the increasing number of their zoo veterinarians spend time out in the field passing on their skills or treating very sick wild animals. So there's a very definite place for a good zoo on the other hand, other zoos should be closed down. They either can't or don't want to provide the right sort of conditions. Very often it's lack of money, but sometimes it's lack of understanding, to be honest. And the enclosures are small and barren, and for the animals it's imprisonment. And there are some animals, um, elephants, unless they're in a sanctuary with space and pools to bathe in, they should not be in zoos, and whales and dolphins never. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goodall, do we have uh, time for another two more questions? Yep, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank then you. we'll have Chardu ask you another question. Then I will ask you the last question. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Um, uh, my last question would be, uh, we know that the chimpanzee societies are uh, male dominant. Um, do you think this has something to do with their biological features or is, is it more, uh, as we know now, cultural, like in human societies, as it evolved later uh, culturally? Well, I think it's probably a bit of both, mm -hmm. but definitely the males are bigger and stronger than the mm -hmm. females. 
And I think, you know, one, one thing that's important to realize is female spends most of her life caring for infants. She carries an infant for four to five years. Yes. And so a female can't afford to indulge in these aggressive displays like the male. Um, because because it would it would threaten you know, how an infant's life would be threatened. The females among themselves have a dominance hierarchy, mm -hmm. and um, for a long time, old Flo was the undisputed alpha female. And uh, in a zoo, when a group is kind of put together from orphans, for a while, females may be the dominant ones, but as the young males grow up, they eventually will dominate the females just because they're bigger and stronger but if we go to the closest chimp relative the bonobo which is equally genetically uh, differentiated from chimps and us we're sort of on a triangle yeah there the sexes are more or less the same size and in a way females are more dominant than males they solve oh. their disputes um people say well should, should we therefore try and model ourselves on bonobos because they're less aggressive? Well, they solve all their disputes with sex. <laughs> I'm not sure that we should model ourselves on them either. How, how can they, um, uh, you know, afford showing those be, uh, aggressive or, or they don't show, they, they evolve to not show, both sides evolve not to show. That's very strange. Yeah, yeah they basically, I mean, there is aggression. It's probably more yeah. aggression than people have said, but I've never studied them, so I'm not yeah. Yeah, okay. feel confident to really answer that. That's okay. I just, yeah. Much less aggression is shown. That's for absolute sure. Mm -hmm. So before we close, we have another question. So like I said in the beginning that we got so many questions and most of the questions were actually related not only to your primatology observations, but also about how you keep your hopes up. So like uh, when we listen to nature, it actually speaks to us. And for a long time, the world has been going in an era of crisis, which can be exemplified with bushfires, climate change, COVID-19 and many more. So we were wondering for like how people living, especially in disadvantaged countries, can gain a holistic view. And what do you think is the most important thing for issue for children youth and young scientists to know what would you what would your message be i guess i asked the same question in the uh, roots and shoes events but i guess we all need hope and we all need the hope that you had when you were a kid and you still have well um <laughs> that's kind of a lot of <laughs> questions in one but anyway basically very many people have lost hope and i think the best antidote to losing hope is to realize you can't change the world. I mean, if you look out at what's going on around the world, it's depressing. There's no question about it. And I get depressed if I think of you know what's going on in the world and how we brought COVID-19 and climate change and species loss. We brought it all on ourselves by our absolute disrespect of nature and our disrespect of animals. But if we just stay wallowing in, in misery because of the state of the world, we shall never get hope. The way to get hope is to say, yes, but I'm here, like right here. I'm in Bournemouth now where I grew up. This is the house I grew up in. What can I do here? And everybody can choose, and Roots and Shoots, you choose three projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment and the kids get to choose, which is why I think it's growing so fast. And um, if you actually start working like uh, clearing litter from a very littered area or removing invasive plants uh, from, from a place that's cluttered up with them or spreading awareness about the nature of the wildlife that's living somewhere and try and get uh, law to protect them, whatever it is, if you succeed and you have others working with you, and you will succeed if you choose the right kind of project to work on. And then you know that all around the world there are other people just like you, feeling just like you, but also 
doing something, rolling up their sleeves, getting out and tackling it, making a difference, seeing that you can make a difference. And then, yes, there are other people who want to make a different kind of difference, and they're doing the same. And so you can gradually see, like you clear a little stream, you make the water clean, it runs out into a river. And as more and more streams go into the river, and a clean water going into the river, and as more and more people along the banks of the river decide to stop throwing their rubbish into the river, the rivers will come out into the ocean much cleaner, and we won't have the same ghastly problem of plastic sort of pollution out in the ocean. So I think the, the thing to do is to find something you can do locally, or you can raise money to help uh, some of the victims of climate change some of the refugees, whatever it happens to be. Find something that you can do, see that you make a difference, and then carry on and do the next thing. And then you will have hope for the future. I mean, you, you, only, the, you know, I have the advantage. I've traveled the world. I have met so many people doing incredible projects, regenerating environments that we've destroyed, giving endangered species another chance. I've seen so many places that were destroyed, which now once again have life. I've met so many incredible people working with street children, working in the slums, making a difference, giving children a chance for a better life. Um, in all of these different spheres, I've met amazing people doing wonderful things. And that's the indomitable human spirit. And once you understand if the media gave a little bit more space to all the amazing things that are happening and the amazing new technologies. For example, one thing I just learned in the last couple of months, which for me is really important because I'm taking a bit longer here, but back in 1968, for the first time, I saw what was going on with um, chimps and monkeys in medical research, tiny barren cages lives of torture and i began a long campaign which finally we got chimpanzees out of medical research but now i've just realized a little bit more about alternatives to all animal experimentation it's called organs on chips and you can look it up there's one the company i've been communicating with is called vivodyne v-i-v-o-v-y-n-e and they can create vaccines with this little chip. It's like a memory stick that you put in your computer. What that little stick can do blows your mind away. And so eventually it can eliminate the need for all this torture of animals that's been going on, billions of animals tortured. And uh, more and more people not eating meat because feeding of the billions of animals in these cruel factory farms it's destroying the environment, wasting water, using methane gas. So, you know, there's so much going on that gives you hope. We need to share that more often. Thank you very much for this very inspiring talk and your last words. I guess what we have to do is to roll up our sleeves and take action mm -hmm. as uh, young scientists, as people, as youth and children, because we know that we can make a difference. So we would like to thank you. And we hope that next time we will see you will be in person in Turkey. We would love to have you here. And we're looking forward to have you, not just us, all the especially youth and children children and university students, they're very excited. So once again, thank you for uh, sharing your time and your journey with us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And just remember everybody, every day you live, you make an impact on the planet and you choose what sort of impact you make. My last word and goodbye everyone. Thank you for giving me the chance to share some ideas with you. Thank Bye. you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Bye. Tekerdan Dr. Guzula kat katkılarından dolayı çok teşekkür ederiz. E, kendisinin katılımı bizim için para biçilemezdi. Şimdi sözlerimiz son bir aydır sizlere ulaştırmayı başardığımız etkinliğimizin yani Evrim ayının hikayesini anlatarak sonlandırmak istiyoruz. 
Biz Boğaziçi Üniversitesi Bilim Kulübü öğrencileriyiz. Üzerimizdeki sınav yüküne ve üniversitedeki sorumluluklarımıza rağmen Türkiye'de bilimin, bilimsel okuryazarlığın gelişmesine katkıda bulunmaya çalışan bir grup öğrenciyiz. Tüm dünyayı etkilemekte olan global pandemi krizi sebebiyle bu yıl altıncısı gerçekleşecek olan geleneksel evrim günlerini değiştirmek zorundaydık. Her sene okulumuzun güzide Güney Kampüsü'nde tarihi bir bina olan Albert Long Hall'de gerçekleştirdiğimiz bilim konferansına her sene bu sene, her sene yaptığımız gibi bu sene yapamama ihtimalle yüzleştik. Tam da bu mutsuzluk anında bize bir melek gibi mucizevi bir dokunuş yapan Aslan X Harlı'nın sayesinde Evrim Ayı'nın temellerini attık. Hemen fikrimizi değerli hocamız Çağrı Mert Bakırcı'ya açarak etkinliğimizi Evrim Ağacı ile birleştirerek uluslararası bir konuma getirdik. Bizim için inanılmaz olan bu değerli etkini yapabilmemizi onlar mümkün kıldılar. Buradan her iki mentorumuza da sonsuz teşekkürler ediyoruz. Ve en başından itibaren derslerinin, sınavlarının yanında her hafta toplantılara katılıp fikir paylaşımında bulunan, sorumluluk alarak bize her türlü destekte bulunan ve yayınlarda da desteklerini göstermeye devam eden tüm takım arkadaşlarımıza, ayrıca tüm organizasyon sürecinde yanımızda olan Bilim Kulübü Yönetim Kurulu'muza çok teşekkür ederiz. Hepiniz inanılmazdınız, iyi ki vardınız ve iyi ki varsınız. Ayrıca biz bu etkinliği organize ettiğimiz esnada, Demokratik olmayan rektör atanmasına 69 gündür tepki gösteren herkese her gün Üstün Ergüdar Meydanı'na giderek rektörlük binasına arkasına dönen hocalarımıza, protestolarına çeşitli yollarla devam eden arkadaşlarımıza teşekkür ederiz. Özgür Akademi talebimizi yeniden dile getiriyoruz, kabul etmiyoruz, vazgeçmiyoruz ve asla aşağı bakmıyoruz. Bu motivasyonla bilimsel çalışmaların değerini bir kez daha vurgulayarak üstümüzde yaratılan karanlığın içinde bilimin ışığını kullanarak aydınlatmaya, ve aydınlanmaya devam edeceğiz. Bizi izleyen, değerli yorumlarıyla ve sorularıyla bize destek veren tüm izleyicilerimize sonsuz teşekkürler. Bu süreci sizlerle paylaşmaktan biz çok keyif aldık. Umarım hepiniz bizim kadar keyif almışsınızdır. Sizlerin desteğiyle çalışmalarımıza devam edeceğiz. Ve son olarak unutmayın. Bu yaşam, bu yaşam görüşünde, görüşünde ihtişam var. <gülüyor> Hoşçakalın.